future moving forward. So um, with that being said, we have the speaker order here. We're going to start with Mr. Rhett Burton, followed by Rhea. And then St I said Stephen, but I don't, I say you go by Steve on most other things. Uh, I just want to call you Steve then. I go professionally, I'll go by Stephen because there is a famous Steve Henneberry who was a actor and bodybuilder. <laughs> All right. That's yeah, not and, me. And, uh, uh, yeah, and I think uh, I think uh, Henebury is spelt wrong on the uh, on the um, it's B E R R Y. Oh, I mean, good. Steve yeah. didn't spot that, Ooh. so I think you got away with it. Yeah, I, I did just spot that, but I figured. <laughs> Don't I worry, that. You, there'll be no no instance of. Uh, <laughs> of is that is that person still alive? By the way. Yeah, if you remember back in the day, he used to be an American Gladiators. He was Tower on American Gladiators. Wow, that's intense. So if you Google Steve Hanaberry bodybuilding, you'll find him. I, I'm, I'm going to do that as a, you know, when you guys start talking, all right? I'm going to jump right, in, <laughs> right into that. So apologies for the spelling mistake, by the way. And then we're going to have Aaron Jones and then Gary Ross. I am your host and moderator for today's discussion. My name is Victor Reeser, and thank you all so much for attending. Hopefully, again, like I said, um, we're going to learn some things about uh, how to adapt online teaching and move forward on our own and also you know working together as educators all together which is really the theme of the conference right so i'm going to go ahead and cover the questions really quickly and then we'll get right to Rhett burton hopefully you're ready <laughs> red um, number one the question that's posed to the panel is teaching in a new setting has its challenges what are some of the challenges faced teaching uh, the, some of the challenges you have faced teaching online courses. How did you adapt or overcome them? The next question I asked is, or that is being asked is, what are some of the positives of teaching online compared to offline classes? What are some things educators can do with online teaching that would not be possible in traditional brick and mortar classes? And I think that's hopefully going to be an exciting one. And finally, the last question posed is, let me find the chat here. Where's my chat window? There we go. I'm gonna go ahead and post this for everybody, by the way. Here we go. The number of educational resources available today can make it difficult for educators to determine what to spend time trying to implement in their classes. What are some important things to consider before trying something new in your classroom? What are your favorite resources to use? Each speaker will have about 10 minutes to discuss their responses to these questions. And afterwards, we will have a short break followed by some Q&A and some time to engage with each other in breakout rooms as time allows. That being said, Rhett, if you are ready, I would love to have you share your screen and we can get right to it. Hello, first and foremost, my name is Rhett Burton and for the I've been living in South Korea for the past 19 years since 2002 that was my first world cup and i listened to your podcast the other day raya and i heard that you came around the same time and since then well you know i've been working in the i were i started my career off as a kindergarten teacher i moved to uh elementary school and then 10 years ago or nine years ago i started up my own study room and that's kind of where i want to start is with getting my kids online now remember, my kids at my study room are young learners. Uh, these two boys are my sons. One is online sometimes and one isn't. Well, they're both sort of online and uh, because they're both using tablets and you know whatnot. And, and I, I've watched them use tablets and I've seen their frustrations with them. So I've learned how to move my curriculum or my content and my my web experience forward online with them, as well as my students uh, at the same time. Uh, I started, I jumped online in, in, uh, in February before kind of everybody went online because I could see it coming and I was, I've been preparing kind of to get online for the past two years. Um, and that's, so I'm gonna step back a few years went before like analyzing this first question of what are some of the challenges you faced with teaching online? Because I want to talk about content first. A lot of people use content from published uh, publishing uh, uh, creators. And when I was, or 
you know, by publishers themselves. And in 2013, when I was 33, I used tons of content produced by, you know, the companies that are, you know, uh, very popular here in Korea and elsewhere in the world. And I kind of created a whole program around the, 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 the content that was available to me. Uh, I, I used a lot of A to Z readers uh, right here. And I used like, let's go. And I spent a lot of my time and energy creating resources that I could print for my students. And that was really nice. But at the same time, I was using technology in the classroom. So I started building websites and, and had you know, homework on, online for them to click and stuff. And I couldn't put this content online because of everywhere I went, it was protected by copyright. So when things are, uh, when things are protected by copyrights, which I'm glad they exist, um, it really makes things, you, you know, you, I had to ask myself the question, you know, like, do I really want to invest the rest of my teaching career in creating content that I can never really sell or share legally? And that was a big question for me. But to be honest, I didn't know what to do because I only knew what I knew how to do. And so I continued down that road of doing what I knew and whether or not it, I knew it wasn't the best choice, but did I really have any other option? And then one day in October, 2015, I was walking down the road and I saw this digital painting school next to my house. I walked inside and I saw this awesome looking place with a lot of art on the wall. And I talked to the owner and I said to him, could you draw me some content? And he said, sure, what do you need? So I went home that night and I sort of drew out a map of where I want my content to go for my, the future. And I drew out this map because as naive as I thought, you know, was, I thought I could create everything with a, a, a year or two years or three years worth of content from one little map. And then, you know, from November of 2015 to present, me and this, this other man, we created a whole program or a whole curriculum of content that I've learned how to take online. So that's how I solved my, you know, the, the content challenge. But then of course, you know, you, when you're going online, you need to have some sort of, you know, delivery system. So, you know, you can't just have images. You need to have, you know, uh, you know I, I chose WordPress because, you know, I started dabbling with it when I was at the elementary school. Uh, so I started using WordPress. I started testing different plugins out, like which one works best with which one. And I learned about LMSs and I tested out some of those. And then, you know, I worked with a theme. So when I deliver my experience, it is a combination of all these different uh, WordPress plugins and, and, and uh, just so, so, uh, so, software as service. And nowadays you can pretty much get anything you need at a price that you can afford if you can make it, if you can afford it. <laughs> and sometimes I can, and sometimes I can't. But I also had to get, you know, so I had to take the, the, the software and the hardware, and I had to make it consumable and usable by my, by my students and my students and whatnot. So I had to design a whole curriculum around that. And I had to curate content from, you know, different sources like YouTube and I use a lot of H5P content in my classes. So getting my students online is, is a challenge because, well, you have to consider their age and you have to consider you know, what they like and what they can do. And every age is a little bit different. So here I've got my youngest son, Ronan. He can tap on the screen. He can use a mouse. He can't right click. He can't use a trackpad. Jamin, and my older son, he can't use a trackpad either too well, but even if they can use the trackpad, they can't read, you know, all these little things. So uh, they don't know what they're clicking on. They just click, 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 click. And the keyboard, my older son, he can find the, the letters, but he can't really spell so well. So it's really hard to, you know, you have to, you have to provide a lot of high support for them. Uh, and my older students, so, you know, Ronan is six, Jamin is eight, his reading is better than his. And older students like my student Mimi, she has an Apple Pencil and we do a lot of co-creation on her iPad. We're using the pencil and 
we listen to stories, we play chess, we do all sorts of things on our iPad through you know, sharing the devices and whatnot. But even she cannot navigate a lot of the administration features that her mom needs to provide. So I still need to communicate with the parents about how to do that. And one-on-one, -on -one, it's easier than one-to-many. So there's tons of challenges working with communicating to parents. So getting kids online isn't just about getting the kids online, but it's also getting their parents online too. At, at the start of COVID, it was a lot harder and now it's kind of more mainstream. So what are some of the positive things about this? What, are, what, what, what can we do? Well, we can learn new tools. So we can learn how to create content we can learn how to organize our content, put that content online. We can learn how to use uh, software solutions like H5P to create uh, interactive content types and a variety of other things. Um, last, the uh, last question is um, uh, time spent trying to implement their classes are important things con to consider. My my, I want to invest my time, energy, and resources into content and processes with high ROI, return on my investment. So basically I've taken all this level two content and I filtered it through my phonics program. So every month that they're learning these, these courses, it's looped back through the phonics curriculum because this is something that they always need to learn. Regardless of the content that, uh, the content that, that I'm delivering to them, I can always redirect them, link them back, recycle them back to the phonics. So when you sit, when you actually learn the tools and you learn the process to use those tools, you can get very good at creating online content for students. Um, I don't know, do I have any, how much more time do I have, Victor? I, I guess I'll, I'll so- Like I'll one minute, sir. Okay, so if I have one minute, then I'll just quickly, this is so I created a website that, you know, allows my students to go to, actually, I should click on our class. I've got one minute, uh, click here, and then I've curated the story, the, the stories uh, so that it goes bit by bit. I use uh, instructional design so that they can quickly get to where they want. They need songs, I got access to songs. Here's the, the phonics that links back to every, what's that? It links back to all the short vowels. And then it, you can jump to the exercises as well. So the students, when they go home and they need to practice at home for a little bit, they can click here by themselves and they can get that high support um, uh, interactive activities that they couldn't really get um, with, with, um, with just uh, by themselves, studying by themselves. So here, he, he is, he is happy because, now they've learned these rebus strategies because he can uh, catch the ball, the ball. And then they check it, they don't feel bad because they got something wrong, they can just recorrect themselves. and. I use a variety of different tools like this throughout. That's my great, Mr. Burton. We are out of time though, sir. All right, so now I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Victor. Thank you. We're gonna to go to Rhea and that, that was great. Thank you so much, Red. You're welcome. Yes, we are gonna start a club, the 2002 World Cup. Yeah, I like that. my red shirt <laughs> with Reese too. So I'm gonna jump in and share my screen. Okay, let me get this game rolling in here. Um, I have been here since 2002 and taught pretty much every age group as well, including kindergarten. I'm really impressed with what you did there with young learners online. That's freaking amazing, seriously. <laughs> um, currently I teach university students and this is very similar to a presentation that I have already done today, but I'm gonna put it in context of these questions. I feel like a lot of these questions I do answer in this short presentation. So I started teaching hybrid classes three years before COVID started. I was using Google Classroom and training my students to use various softwares, including Google Classroom, 
Flipgrid, Kahoot. And in my graduate degree, I had the same experience as a student myself, halfway through the program, they decided to uproot the more traditional style of learning and make us have a major in digital media. So it worked out well to prepare me for this experience. A flipped classroom is this acronym, as you can see. And the metaphor behind it, for hundreds of years, we have learned in the classical education style of a sage on stage who lectures and students passively listen especially in Korea, that's true. For some of you, you know how to speak Korean and you say, suap, class, durayo, you listen to the class. Teacher, I didn't listen to your class well. Instead of take, like the Viking word that we stole in the English language, which is more active. So in a flipped classroom, the teacher is more of a facilitator and they create a learning environment in which the students have a lot of power to move around and choose how they're going to go about. You have a system of organized chaos that has been intentionally planned and you are there to help with the little niggly things that come along. Um, one way to know if you have really flipped your class is thinking about teacher talking time versus student talking time. So in some classes when I'm giving instruction on how a test is going to work or for a project I will talk more but most classes it's about 90% students talking and I just bop in between their groups either in a real classroom or in an online classroom. I could put this into perspective also from the very beginning of COVID, my university went 100% online and Zoom from the get-go. So that's how we've been for two semesters and we'll be doing it for sure the next semester, possibly the next two semesters, I don't know. Um, more about the flipped classroom design, you have the students do a lot of work before they come to the class and I think the best way to do that is to have a very clear rubric um, and a very clear syllabus available in many forms, video with visuals, repeating information a lot in different places, making sure students feel comfortable to come to you. A lot of it is building trust and rapport with students. So important to be approachable and take down those barriers. Like I mentioned, layers of communication is really important for students to take their time to understand what you're saying. Just because you said it or put it there doesn't mean they got it. So it has to be somewhere they can find it again. And it's good to repeat the things that are really important. I make things as short and concise as possible when I'm giving instructions. Levels in the classroom, most people deal with very multi-leveled classes of students. In the flipped learning environment, which is using technology in a hybrid or online class, it can be really a benefit actually, because you'll have a group of students talking and when a slightly lower level student is paired with a slightly higher level student with the right coaching, the higher level student helps the lower level student to guide them through conversations. And the higher level student benefits because when you teach something, that's when you learn it really well. So that's the system. And I tell the students that. I make them understand that everything I do is for a reason. That's the intentional aspect. So my semester, I see it as three stages. I have the breaking through, the middle stage of expansion, and then a reflective stage. And the breaking through, it's really about creating a comfort zone, making clear rules, starting slowly and incrementally, making things a bit more complex. But we build up a routine that they learn to expect and get settled into. By the middle stage, um, most of my classes, they have done the work in the book. They've seen all the same discussion questions. They write their answers out. They do the same unit for two weeks. And then they're just in breakout rooms, meeting one person after another after another. And I tell them, you can choose the questions that you want. You can read your answers first until you're comfortable. And like any skill that you learn, when you repeat it again and again and again and again, you're going to get smoother and it gets more natural. So you don't even have to think about it. During that time, I go through and tweak problems of grammar or conversation skill or whatever I need to focus on if they're having trouble with the logistics of how the class works. And then at the very end, we have assessments and we have a reflection project that I'll talk about a little bit. So some examples of ways that I guide my students is I give them different conversation skills to focus on throughout. I teach them how to paraphrase. For example, I hear, 
I want to be a pilot. And then the other person doesn't understand. So they just say the same thing again and again and again, like banging their head into the brick wall. And I'm like, don't do that. How about using some different ways to explain? Fly a plane, Korean air, you know, even use gestures if you have to. Ah, so that's paraphrase. So I teach them how to do that. I encourage them to make eye contact. And one of Victor's questions is what you think goes better. I think that in Zoom, there's much better eye contact than when I have the students in the same room together over the course of the semester. They're really tuning into each other, looking at each other, reading the expressions. And I think the connection is really good. I'm really impressed with it, to be honest. When they're focused on that, they don't really have to think about intonation. It just becomes more natural. Um, I encourage students to really focus on that person that they're listening to and find out what they're interested in, find the common ground. You both like to talk about computer games, go for it. You can do that the whole time. If that person is not interested in that, find something that you both like to discuss. Um, Getting into the practice of asking follow-up questions is not intuitive from the beginning, but by the end of the semester, they've got uh, a better comfort with this level. So we have lessons on that and we keep repeating it. I also remind them, this is more towards the end of the semester, don't let things get too expected and robotic. Throw some surprises in there. Talk about what you saw in the news today, or feel free to throw something at that person that they were not expecting to keep things fresh. I also teach my students about self-care, developing a routine, taking time away from the screen, feeding themselves properly, sleeping, because they go through, especially in high school, this time where they think suffering is better. If, you, if it's harder, you're going to succeed, and I have to kind of retrain them out of that thinking. Um, I monitor accuracy based on the mistakes that I hear in class, take notes, and at the end we do some corrective feedback as a group on a few general mistakes. And my assessments are the students join in groups of three on Zoom with me listening camera off. They make a recording of a 10 minute conversation based on questions they practiced in the class. Then they'll go off, listen to the recording again, make a transcript, and send it to me. And I grade very generously, I think. Assessments are a chance to bolster confidence even more than anything else. I grade them according to how well they give me those assignments back if they show up, participation, and then I have a rubric that I've designed of conversation skills that I share with them. At the end of the semester, there is a reflection exercise. After they do the written reflection exercise, they look at the project they did at the beginning and the end and think in general. I give them another rubric to think about it. Commonly, I find that they want to travel more, their confidence is higher, some of them say their personality is more outgoing, they are more motivated to study English, TOEIC scores can improve, and they just get a little bit more into that process-oriented instead of product-oriented mode that I want them to get into, therefore increasing their agency. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to just jump right to the end and say, please contact me later if you have more questions, but we'll talk more in the breakout rooms. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. So far, two for two. Excellent job. I'm, I'm having a great time. Hopefully you guys are as well. Yeah. All right. Mr. Henbury? Hen Henbury? <laughs> Henbury. 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 Got it. There yep. you go. It only took me, you know, four times. No worries, no worries. It's not, not necessarily an easy one. Okay, um, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Steve Henneberry. I'm uh, coming to you all from Japan today. And you can see my screen okay? Okay. Um, I've been teaching in Japan at the university level since 1998. And uh, that's my story. Um, so, I took a more global look at the questions that Victor provided us with today. So I'm going to approach each question on its own. And the first is um, the challenges faced in this past year. And first, at the beginning of last year, I thought that 2020 was going to be the year of anxiety because many of us, when April was approaching, 
does your academic year start in April in Korea as well? Uh, March for universities, but it depends on what. Okay, so you guys are a month ahead of us. We start in April in Japan. And as, as the time was approaching, we were all wondering, well, how is the system going to go this year? Because we didn't know. And I think I saw that um, Lindsay was saying in the podcast interview you guys did with OTJ the other night that the university kept on saying, we're going to do face-to-face in two weeks. And in two weeks, we're going to start classes. And that's what happened with me. We thought classes would begin at the beginning of April, but then they said, nope, we're going to wait two weeks. And then just the day before those two weeks, like, well, nope, we're going to wait two weeks. And then finally they decided, well, let's just go online. So there was a lot of anxiety and tension for everybody. And a lot of the staff, the teaching staff, were now struggling to find a way to fit square pegs into round holes because they're trying to take their materials that they've prepared over years, they've been using year in, year out, and now they need to deliver it online. And for some people, this is very, very stressful. There were some stories in Japan of like older professors who chose to retire rather than trying to adapt to this new online, online methodology. And so it's very stressful and caused a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. And one of the challenges that you faced once you got the students into your classroom was the feeling of connectedness. Because it's kind of hard to feel connected to somebody when you're looking, when you're thinking of just looking through this square window in your room, this magic window that lets you communicate. And a lot of us were apprehensive about how effective a language class would be online. And I think in particular, when you consider the first year students, the freshmen were uprooted from their hometowns and they came off very excited to start their university life. And they moved into a new town. They were immediately told, don't leave your apartment for two weeks. And then they couldn't have face-to-face classes. They couldn't have face-to-face club activities. They couldn't meet each other. So suddenly you have all these students who moved into university and were forced to live these secluded lives. And I think it caused a lot of anxiety and stress for our students in this past year. So while this presentation today is about 2021, looking back at 2020 was very stressful. And I think rather than being the year of anxiety, it was really the year of empathy. It was the year that we as teachers had to learn to empathize with our students more and take into consideration the stress and anxiety that they were coping with. Uh, Some of our students were dealing with deaths back home for their family who was sick from from, uh, COVID and things like that. And of course, just from the simple stress of being in a strange town and not having any not having been able to make any new friends. And I think that was incredibly stressful for students. Um, So those were, I think, were the biggest challenges that I faced, or I think many of us faced in the last year. As to the positive aspects of teaching online, ironically, um, again, connectedness. Like Rhea said, eye contact is better online. And one of the things I found really interesting was that I was able to communicate better with my students online than I was in the face-to-face classroom. I was closer to the students because you don't have as many distractions, especially if you make effective use of breakout rooms. I found that by putting students into smaller groups for group work and task-based activities, that the groups are much more intimate 
And because they're in a breakout room, um, it's just the four of them or just the three or two of them. And as teachers, when we teach like a task-based lesson and the students are all in group work, what we do is we don't do the stage on the stage like, like Rhea was referring to, but the guy by the side, we walk around and we observe the students while they're having their interactions, offer support where we can. And, but in the classroom, in the physical classroom, when I'm walking around and I'm speaking to say group one out of six groups that I usually have, group one has about 60 to 80% of my focus. The other 20 to 40% is listening to the other groups in the room, listening for students who've, who've fallen back into L1, listening for students who are just sitting silently and listening for students who are just messing about. So even while I'm speaking to a group in the physical classroom, I'm slightly distracted. Additionally, the students who are having their group discussion are distracted by my presence. The group next to them is distracted because they're wondering what I'm saying to this group. But in the online environment with Zoom in the breakout rooms, you can't hear anything outside of the breakout rooms. So there's a great deal more intimacy in the interaction and it allows students to really focus on the task. And I think this is one of the greatest things of moving the classes online is the students were able to connect better and they were able to focus in a much more productive way. So I look at this online teaching that we've, we've done now using the Zoom, it's kind of like growing flowers in a greenhouse. It's kind of the perfect environment. It's not nature. It's not the same as face-to-face -face classroom where you can actually interact with a person in the same physical space, but we've created a very good environment that has just the right amount of light, just the right amount of heat and just the right amount of moisture. So it works really well. And also moving into the digital era, era, away from the analog papers, you can do a lot more portfolio assessment. And this is one thing that I've been working on for a couple of years because I started, um, I gave a presentation a couple of years ago about digital assessment of analog work where I was basically collecting student homework at the beginning of class, running it through a sheet feed scanner, scanner during class and giving it back to them at the end of class. And the reason was because I don't like taking students work away from them. I want them to hold on to those resources because those are the study materials. I want them to maintain a copy and I want myself to have a copy as well. And I think with digital assignments, that works really well. Uh, my university, we use Teams and Moodle and uh, other tools as well. So it allows you to have access. Uh, both the teacher and the student has complete access to their- uh, Steve, this is really great. You got two minutes. Thank you. Um, and of course, less paper, less paper. And I've only got two minutes. So just quickly move on to question three, which I don't have much to say on, but um, considerations when adopting new technology. Number one has to be the technology must have a clear purpose and the students must understand that purpose and um, be engaged with that purpose. And there also has to be easy to use. And rather than going into like how you go through all these decisions, because I'm not going to tell you all the tools I use, I recommend Gallagher's decision matrix, which is something that Brian Gallagher um, from Japan made. And I'll give you a QR code so you can download this. I'll put a link in the chat, but this gives you eight different uh, questions to use and score any new tool that you wanna use before deciding if you should implement it or not. It's a really good matrix to use, so I highly recommend it. 
Um, there's the QR code, but since I assume you don't have time, I will just drop the link in the chat. Okay. And that's all I have to say for today, except if 2020 was a year of empathy, I think 2021 is the year that we will be thriving. I think 2020 was surviving. Now, I think we're ready to thrive, built on the foundation that we've developed over the last year. And with that, I concede my time. Very nice work. Thank you so much. That was excellent. This has been great so far, everybody. Um, Steven, if you could do me a favor, if you could just yeah. drop that QR code and perhaps the picture of that matrix, yep. the assets on our on our panel discussion, oh, yeah. on Eva and Zilla, that would be really yeah. great. Um, I'll drop yeah. it in the chat as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That looks really cool. I'm very interested in looking into the research behind that, too. Um, and we're going to move right on to Mr. Aaron Jones. Are you ready? I'm good to go. All right. Can I, is, is my time officially started? You're good. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron. I teach at the University of Seoul. Um, I'm a little bit newer here to Korea. I moved here in 2017, so no 2002 World Cup. I regret to say, but I have been teaching at the university for seven years now. Uh, half of that was in the US and half of that was here. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint. All right, so, um, oh, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so uh, first of all, uh, so thriving in the online classroom is where I'd like to go today. So let me just introduce a little bit about before COVID, uh, and then kind of how I got introduced into a lot of uh, the online classroom settings. So uh, when I was teaching in the States, actually I taught completely online uh, university courses. I was actually uh, involved in teaching undergrad courses in technology integration in the classroom, uh, ironically enough. And so it was all online. A lot of it was uh, asynchronous as opposed to synchronous, but I, was, I already had a lot of exposure to online teaching and to conducting uh, classroom settings online because in the US we've been doing that for several years. Many universities have been doing it for decades where we teach online, we're fairly comfortable. But then when I came to Korea, I quickly saw that there was not too much experience, if any, in the university setting online. And so uh, when COVID rolled around, there was a lot of confusion. There was a lot of uh, uncertainty of how things are going to unfold. So I'm gonna start by directly answering uh, Victor's question. The first question about challenges, and I'll kind of start by, uh, I'm gonna go through all these questions and I'm gonna talk about some specific things that I do in my classroom that have been, uh, that I found to uh, increase the success of my classroom. So when we started, when COVID happened, and my university was not sure what to do. Uh, first, they delayed it by two weeks. Then they're like, okay, well, we'll survive another two weeks. So just make some pre-recorded lectures, put it on YouTube, and then we'll figure it out. Well, for me teaching a speaking class at the university, that doesn't really grant opportunity to ensure your students actually speak if you record a two-hour lecture on YouTube. But that's what they asked us to do. So we did that. And then it looked like, okay, this is not gonna be a two week or a month long thing. So we moved to Zoom and that's when the challenges and opportunities began to arise. So at first, I think, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if uh, Rhea or Steve mentioned this, but when the freshmen came for their first semester, they were excited for all the MTs. They were excited to meet their, you know, their upperclassmen and get involved in all these things. And it's just, it's all gone. You know, they just, they're staying at home. They're watching, TV, basically they're watching their laptops, they're watching their phones. And many of the professors didn't know what to do either. They're, you know, they may have, you know, they never did any interactive things. They just lectured their whole academic lives. And, and suddenly they have to fill two hours of teaching time and they filled up like 30 minutes and then ended the class. And so there was a lot of challenges and difficulties um, that we had to overcome and that we had to adapt. So one of the challenges that I saw uh, was the challenge of interaction. Uh, our students are digital natives. They have, they're very fluent in the digital language. They are very fluent in media. Um, 
but they in their minds compartmentalized that this doesn't exist in education. That, oh, I can go watch, you know, I can pull up a webtoon, I can go to Netflix, I can do, you know, I can become a YouTuber. But when it comes to education, you know, a, a real university class, what? I, I have to, you know, I have to be there, just like Rhea said, you know, Suop Troyo, I listen to your class. Uh, so interaction was the first challenge. How do I break the students out? How do we uh, make a warm environment online that it can be cold if it's not created correctly? So um, one of the first things I did, uh, one of the first things I do in my regular classes is that I talk about myself, I introduce my family, and I introduce my pets. And I actually got the chance to do that physically. I have two birds. I'm a, I'm a bird guy. So I was able to bring my birds and show them in front of the students. And the students are like, oh my gosh, you have birds? Like I could have never, I can't bring my birds to my physical classroom, but I was able to show the students and to open up the ice breaking, open up the interactions and just help them to feel more comfortable. And as the class went along, just like Rhea said, like about the first third of the class was the, basically the uh, hidden objective every day was to, hey, talk to each other, it's okay. Uh, we're all in this together, just do the best you can. And so uh, as that came, as that, uh, as the classroom structure began to blossom and began to evolve, that meant 80% interaction, 20% lecture. Uh, and that's really what I try to do every, every week. And as a main focus of my class, just make sure that the students are always having a chance to be in a breakout room uh, or a way to that they can interact with each other, even if we're all together in a class and that mistakes are welcome. Uh, one of my rules that I have in my class is that you have to have your camera on uh, because many students will try to have their camera off. They're like, oh, teacher, I didn't take a shower today or oh, you know, I just woke up like one minute ago and class started. And I'm like, well, you know, it's part of your participation because speaking is involved with facial communication, nonverbal communication. And having that simple rule uh, really helped with my interaction. Another, another issue that I had, and this is especially with the second semester. The first semester, it was still new and students were still respectful, but the second semester I saw was they became more comfortable and many of my students kind of figured out how to game the system. Uh, how can I look at a webtoon and then participate in class at the same time? Or how can I, you know, play with my dog and enter class with, and engage with class at the same time? Uh, so then a real challenge for me was to find engaging online content that would definitely reach out and eliminate, as best I could, these distractions. Uh, and what I found out was using, so what I would use in my regular classroom before COVID was competition. I, I love competition. I love uh, pitting them against each other, you know, always uh, speaking competitions, timed competitions, and finding ways to integrate that into the classroom was a way that I overcame engagement issues. And so I'm going to actually introduce a couple of those competition ideas that I have integrated to great success in my classroom. Uh, retention was another issue that we all face, I feel, with online teaching. Uh, this is again, a, a, a issue that's actually becoming more and more prevalent the more we're teaching online. The first semester I taught, it was very similar. The retention was similar to tr traditional classes, but as students have learned how to engage while also doing something else, their attention is slowly decreasing. Uh, so I, I'll ask a student, I'll, I'll say something, an instruction, or maybe a bit of a tidbit of advice, and then later on, about 15 minutes later, I'll ask three different students what I said and none of them can say. Uh, students are, they're distracted. A lot of them are distracted and there's a little, there's not a lot of accountability that we can implement or that is available. Uh, that's where we have to find, again, find those engagement strategies, try to reach out into a way that speaks to digital natives. Uh, we have to think like them. We have to go to their world and that's the best way that we can overcome this retention issue. I'm just gonna quickly go through this. Breaking the ice, I've talked about, this is one of the biggest issues. So once you can break the ice, your class will be so smooth. And behavior, um, I do have a couple of students who enjoy waking up five minutes before class and they can't, they barely even understand anything because their brain is still sleeping. Uh, these are some things that as 
more uh, college students, upper level students, they have to, we have to address, you know, uh, giving them the opportunity to uh, fix some behavioral issues and addressing those. But these are some of the challenges that I saw, but what I saw more so in the online teaching was the opportunities. So question two, what are the positive, uh, what are the positives of teaching online compared to offline? One positive I saw was flexibility. Um, when I was, when you teach in the, when you teach in the physical classroom, we always have students who show up late. Teacher, I overslept. Oh my gosh, I took a taxi and I ran here and I'm sweating, but I'm here, right? But you know, that's 30 minutes late. Uh, they can't really learn because they're so flustered. But flexibility, um, all those students do wake up like five minutes before class. They can also wake up five minutes before class and come to class. It offers great flexibility for schedules, great flexibility for learning wherever you are. Um, it's just opened up so many doors that students have taken advantage of uh, in their learning. Another positive thing, uh, thing that I've seen is that it is actually a very good substitute for traditional speaking classes, that many of the elements of traditional speaking classes, such as presentations, uh, such as uh, interactions through Zoom breakout rooms, can continue as if they were a traditional classroom. That there's been very few features. One minute, Aaron. Oh my gosh, seriously? Ah, okay. So there, <laughs> there's been very few features that cannot be substituted. Uh, efficiency, self-reflection. Uh, Steve mentioned it, that portfolios, uh, portfolios are a great way to assess. And I found that using, uh, that using presentations through YouTube, that having students record themselves over and over through several times throughout the semester and looking back at those is a great way for a portfolio self-reflection that really they wouldn't have a chance to do in a physical classroom. Uh, it's eco-friendly, uh, paperless, and integration of various online resources, which I guess I'll have to move to my breakout room uh, at the end. So, so, uh, so what are the important things to consider before using something new in your classroom? Always make sure the technology fits your objectives, not the objectives fit the technology. You always have to have something, uh, you have an objective, but you always need to find technology that fits the objective. For me, I wanted a competitive English classroom and I had to find technology to fit that. I didn't find a technology like, oh, this is great. Let me shove it into my classroom. It won't work like that. Uh, so my favorite things for competitions are like board games, quizzes. Uh, I use Google Forms, uh, Google Slides. I make a board game that everyone can access and play together. I use quizzes.com, which I share a link and everyone can compete at the same time, just as I would in the physical classroom. Uh, and last point, Victor, uh, for our students, studying online has opened up a whole new world. Uh, to them that they didn't know that they could do well and they could that they could succeed in. Um, and so I honestly see a hard time to going back to the traditional classroom because students have tasted the online classroom. I think that they are going to have they're going to have the experiences of the online classroom when they go back to the traditional classroom. So finding ways that we can take what we've done well in the, the online classroom and put it back in the traditional classroom is going to be vital when we transition back to face to face. So Thank on you, that Victor. note, I'm going to cut you off there, Mr. Jones. I think you did a great job, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I know there's just so much to say. I, I do appreciate it. Thank you for filling that time with a lot of good information and some great insights. As everyone else has done so far, really fantastic job. We're going to go to our last speaker, and then we're going to take a short break before we return for Q&A. So let's go ahead and go to Mr. Gary Ross whenever you're ready. Um, can you hear me okay? Is uh, hi there, everyone. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, okay, so um, um, in addition to my uh, work uh, within uh, ESL in Japanese University, um, I'm also a, a designer and a programmer. So I'm kind of naturally interested in the tech developments that help us in the classroom. Um, my background and my teaching environment, Japanese university programming, might mean my focus is quite different from some of you uh, listening today. Um, and I think um, COVID has forced us to reassess how we interact. Perhaps online teaching presents us with opportunities that we may not have looked at as deeply before. I'm not necessarily thinking of COVID challenges here. I'm more really thinking 
to this situation to solve and reassess old challenges, challenges from the past that we have maybe need to look at again. And one of the things I'm interested in, um, and maybe this is not gonna exactly answer the three questions as they presented, but learning a language is different, isn't it? I mean, in our first language, we innately acquire the lower order skills of our own language. Um, this is well below the bottom rung of Bloom, for example. I mean, grammar production, vocabulary acquisition, hearing words, processing them. Um, we are world-class at these things by the age of three or four, such that the average toddler is far better than most of my university students. Um, I wish um, we had Rhett Burton um, over here in Japan developing the school curriculum for the, for the kids in Japan. Um, so, so basically in our own language, we approach higher order skills such as you know, like forming an argument, telling a story, explaining an idea, writing a paper, telling a joke, analyzing concept, uh, presenting at Cotisol, when we already have total control over our lower order skills. You might be thinking, hey, actually, that's debatable as you're watching me trying to um, navigate this uh, talk. Um, I can't really think of any other endeavor where we teach or use higher order skills before we are really good at the lower order skills. Nobody does a concert re recital or does improvisation with a jazz trio when they're still fumbling with the mechanics of playing the piano. Um, musicians have got the mechanics of playing down to muscle memory such that they focus on the tune, not the mechanics um, of actually playing. And typing and driving are other examples. And also, at least when you are learning the piano, your teacher is not speaking Peonese, a language that you don't yet understand. And you know, this is why uh, second language teaching is the hardest job in the world. Um, it's much harder than programming, for example, because of you are teaching people who don't understand the thing that you are teaching, okay? in the language of what you're trying to get them to understand. So I think if we are to succeed in these higher order things, then we need kind of total confidence at the more lower order things. And here's, here's where the problem lies. In Japan, at least students are asked to do these higher order language activities when they have very lower skill, low skills at lower order stuff. And this is, I think this can be pretty demoralizing. The student might be thinking, yes, I can order, I can analyze this difficult concept, I simply don't have the skills to translate my deep thoughts into English. Um, and Rhea brought this up. She talked about doing things again and again and again and again and kind of making variety of them in order to um, help the student improve in these kind of low order activities. Now, low order practices, I think are seen as kind of boring and repetitive. Um, it doesn't look great on a university syllabus. By the end of this course, you'll be able to form questions instantly and without thought. Um, and that's not to mention that in Japan, students spend maybe um, 10 years in the classroom. It's still boring and they still don't acquire these lower order skills when they come to university. So they're kind of woefully under, uh, unprepared for this. So, I mean, how is this uh, related to the online classroom and the position we find ourselves in now? Well, it's, it's generally understood that these lower order skills are things that can be achieved through practice that certainly doesn't need to do, be done in a classroom setting. Um, the acquisition of these skills re requires a fair amount of autonomy. The student needs to take control of their own learning. Um, I think it's important to, we can discuss motivation later, but they're obviously they're tied together. Now, so there are basically there are new online tools that are enabling students to take control of this learning themselves and you know, acquiring these lower order skills but the teacher can definitely kind of guide them. So I'd like, I, where, where I'm kind of interested in is the kind of tools that students can use outside the classroom, the flipped classroom in order to integrate stuff within the classroom. I'm just going to, I'm just going to share a couple of tools. One of them I'm developing myself as an update to a tool of learning Japanese and the other is a tool that I use a lot in my classroom and encourage the students to use on their own. Um, so I'm gonna share the screen. Let me just go to share screen. Here we go. Um, and let's see. Right, here we go. No, that's the wrong screen. I'm just going to, and of course, now that I come to, I'm, 
I'm, I'm, I'm meant to be the programmer here and I can't even share the screen correctly. Hold on, here we go. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna share the, um, I'm just gonna sh and I've got to share the sound and optimize the video, click uh, share. Okay, so, um, so can everyone see the screen here? Um, yes. Yes, you can. Okay, great, 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 great. So uh, this 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 is an example of this is um, this is a this is a tool that I use a lot in the classroom where students are learning a lot of new words. Um, I, I I teach uh, pharmacy students and they struggle they struggle with new vocabulary. And just because they learn it today doesn't necessarily mean it they're going to learn it tomorrow. And but they're able to take control of their learning because they are choosing the type of terms that they are using. So I'm just going to, this is, this is called um, Youglish. Okay, I'm just going to, I'm just, I've just typed in optimism. And if I click, say it here. Okay. But I feel like that takes a degree of optimism. I so let's go on to the next one. So if the students like, I want to, I want to learn the word optimism. There, an implacable optimism, a strange mixture of humility and daring and enthusiasm and optimism. Well, this is appropriate, isn't it? One reason for such optimism over a frozen world like Mars is evidence that two billion years ago. And um, this is this is an example of a, a tool that I've developed for myself uh, for for learning for learning Japanese, where um, this is an example of the kind of technologies that we're beginning to reassess and look at. Um, so, for example, this is learning Japanese. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that many of you can't read this, um, but students can, if you're like me and you're a student of Japanese, you can't necessarily read something like this. You can kind of click and, okay, here's the verb, a more think. And then um, you can kind of put your own ideas for example, like mind in here, and then you can get the thing to read. Yare yare, mata doitsu ka, to boku wa omotta. Yare yare, mata doitsu ka, to boku wa omotta. Okay, here we go. So I think, I think uh, from my point of view, the, the real key thing with the, with the situation that we find ourselves in now is that we want to reassess the kind of tools that work in the classroom and see if maybe the, the situation that we find ourselves in now will actually make us rethink what we are going, how we actually teach a second language um, and refocusing on some of these things that might, might actually be more effective within the COVID situation. In other words, re-looking at getting students to be better at lower order skills. Um, and those are just those are just two examples. And yesterday's uh, keynote talk was about uh, you know uh, was it keynote talk the the plenary or keynote um, about fu the future of language acquisition and language learning. Um, AI is not going to replace a teacher as such, but I think a lot of the AI tools, things like rec speech recognition or the ability for an AI to be able to practice with um, practice in close situation like a doctor or patient interaction. Um, these kind of tools are going to give us really big opportunities to focus on some of the things that we don't like to do in the classroom and then get left behind. So for example, these lower order things that, well, we don't necessarily want to spend classroom time teaching a student how to form a question, but on the other hand, my students can't do things like this. So these kind of new types of focus, I think this is where um, uh, COVID is, is kind of helping us out because it's making us rethink uh, these ideas. Um, and I think my 10 minutes is up. So uh, my alarm just went off. So I think that's maybe a good time uh, to finish there. So actually, uh, maybe a last point, I think Aaron says that we need to engage students so that they actually want to improve. And so improving autonomy is a way forward in this, in this situation, I think. I think that was wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone today. Mr. Ross, that was great.
I appreciate that.